Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, God. We worship you, mighty God. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Oh, yes, God. Oh, Jesus, we love you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We exalt your mighty God. <clears throat> we worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Oh, God, we exalt you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your grace. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you. Oh, yes, God. We love you, Jesus. God, be exalted today. Be exalted today. Be exalted today, Lord. Be exalted today. Y ando son de la lava, qui ando son de la lava haya. Oh, in the name that is above every name. In the name that is above every name. Ando son de la lava haya. Oh, Jesus, we love you, God. We thank you, Jesus. Ando son de la lava haya. Oh, Jesus, I love you. <clears throat> We start in here in just a moment, friend. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Oh, yes, God. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, good day, friend. Good day. Good to have you with us. Pastor Daniel Dagan, Hope Apostolic, United Pentecostal Church, Port Charlotte, Florida. Great to have you with us. 1 p.m. Eastern Time here on the East Coast, January 15th. And we want to start out with the word of prayer. Pray for your family and your church and for God's good people. Can we pray? Lord God, I thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your love and for your kindness. God, that you would have your way today. Be exalted, mighty God, as our word goes forth. Let it find a place, God, and root and seed into the hearts and the lives of thy good people. God, touch them if they're locally or abroad. God, touch and stir them, God, and bless their churches that souls can be saved and prepared for thy coming. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord God, we humbly pray. Amen, amen, amen. <clears throat> Good to be with you today. We continue today with our series, our Friday 1 p.m. series, where we've been studying now since mid-March on the subject of end-time prophecy, end-time prophecy. And I will continue today <clears throat> subject study that we began a few weeks ago, specifically under the arena of end-time prophecy. We begin to study the seven churches. I've done the first lesson. Focus was just an introduction and emphasis on December 4th. You can go back on the same Facebook video and watch it. The second lesson of this series on the seven churches of Revelations 2 and 3. <clears throat> it was on December 11th and it was covering the church of Smyrna and Pergamos. And then here last week. It was the third lesson of this series, January 8th, and it was on Thyra, Tyra, and Sardis. And today, <clears throat> I want to turn the corner on this series, the seven churches of Asia Minor, yea, of Revelations 2 and 3. And I want to begin to cover the church of Philadelphia, and we'll probably touch towards the end a little bit, the seventh church, the church of Laodicea, Laodicea. And as we go into this, I direct you in your Bible to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 down to verse 13. Again, just to give you some introductory comments and 
Some are watching live. Some will come on over the next hours we teach. And then some have messaged me and text me and emailed me, called me and told me that they'll watch it later as an archive. And we understand that. Please share these as God so leads you. But just to give a couple introductory comments, when you study Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3, the church of the seven, the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia receives a, the greatest words, absent any strong rebuke. Smyrna and Philadelphia receives no word of correction. Philadelphia receives a very glowing admonishment, as you'll see today. And then the churches of Sardis and Laodicea. We taught on Sardis last week, the beginning of chapter 3. We'll teach on Laodicea next week, but we'll just touch on a couple of things towards the end of today's lesson on Laodicea. But the church of the seven, Sardis and Laodicea, receive clearly the strongest word of rebuke, the strongest word of correction. And there's commonalities as you study through these seven churches. There's commonalities to all of them. The Lord speaks. Yea, through and to the angel of the church. He tells every congregation, all seven, go back and study it. He tells every congregation, you have to overcome. He gives every congregation an opportunity to go forward with him. And there's several promises that are sprinkled throughout these seven writings. Yea, to the broader church as a whole from the day of Pentecost up until the rapture. Can I have an amen if you're with me today? <clears throat> and I, I have explained this early on in the first lesson on the seven churches of Revelations 2 and 3. Let me say it again as we get into a study of the Church of Philadelphia. I've said, I think it's right to say it, historically, scripturally, it's right to say it. When you study these seven churches, they were seven literal churches in what we would know today as Turkey. But in scripture times, it was called Asia Minor. And they were within reason relatively close to each other. Now travel and distance was certainly different then, but within a few hundred miles, all of these churches were relatively close to each other in terms of our descriptions today. So the seven literal congregations existed towards the end of the first century. And some of them even are referenced, of course, in the Pauline epistles and the seven general epistles. The 14 Pauline epistles and the seven general epistles. Ephesus, of course, is there. Thyatira is mentioned in Paul's writings. Laodicea is, is mentioned as to have an epistle sent to it in Paul's writings and so forth. So these are seven literal cities, seven literal congregations that existed towards the middle, yea, to the end of the first century going forward. Additionally, these seven churches, I think it's accurate. They represent, they capture, I taught this early on. I'm just doing a little review as we go into this. They capture, they represent a mindset, yea, a strength, different weaknesses or struggles that the church will face from the initiation of the church, the birthing of the church in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, up until the rapture. Well, with that, we launch into today's lesson. I don't think it's by chance that the last two churches that are mentioned is Philadelphia and Laodicea. Philadelphia is mentioned in Revelations 3, verse 7 to 13, and Laodicea is mentioned in Revelations 3, 14 to 22. And this is of the seven here so listed. These are the last two. Now, again, there's seven literal churches. These are two literal churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea. I've given historical context for that in each lesson. I will do it again now at Philadelphia. But then as well, these uh, attitudes, these struggles, these spirits, these mindsets, these strengths, that are talked about in these churches are believed to also represent what takes place or what the church is dealing with through the time period of the church age from Pentecost into the rapture. These two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea, 
Philadelphia being the remnant, the great picture of God's bride, the great picture of God's apostolic church, the peculiar people, the people that love the word, love the name, contend for doctrine, stand for holiness. That's what the church of Philadelphia is. You'll see that in a moment. And then Laodicea is everything else that the church of Philadelphia is not. Laodicea is the worldly church, the apostate church, uh, a sensual church, a carnal, cold, yea, lukewarm church. And, and I believe it's accurate to say, and I could give you some verses on this. I include a lesson on this in my book entitled The Unveiling. On In the lesson in the book, it's entitled, the lesson is entitled, What Will the Church Be in the Last Days? And when you think about the church before the rapture, before the rapture, you think about any church you go to, the church you're currently attending, the church I'm honored to pastor, any church in the Bible, any church in the Bible, it is made up of people, fleshly people. And with that, you have some struggles. The church of Corinth, the church of Ephesus, Galatia, so forth. Even to the church of Philadelphia, he tells them you have to overcome. Even though it is a great admonishment and a glowing word that they receive here in Revelations 3, 7 to 13, they've not yet made it to heaven, the saints of the church of Philadelphia. They still have to overcome some things. Satan, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the carnal fleshly nature, and so forth. So every church has present in it because of people Great saints, the remnant, those of the mindset, spirit, like as unto Philadelphia. And every church is not a perfect church. There's not a church where 100% of the people are 100% what they're supposed to be. Uh, and that's absolutely a truth. And every church has some people in it that are like as unto the people of Laodicea. That's why Jesus says that the wheat and the tares grow together, grow together. And in judgment, he'll come and separate them. Why do you think Paul writes to the church about works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5? Why do you think Paul writes to the church about the foolish Galatians that have been bewitched and on and on and on? So these two passages to Philadelphia and to Laodicea, they capture the mentality, the, the ideology, the picture, the mindset of the end time congregation prior to the rapture. You have great saints and then you have the carnal ones that are not just immature because of lack of time and lack of discipleship. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about carnal, lukewarm, worldly saints, Laodicea. And you have that in every church. I could go preach a message Sunday morning, preach the same message, and there'll be some people in the church, I'm honored to pastor, that respond with exuberance and faith and tears and, and receptivity and are reaching out with a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God. And there'll be others that'll be sitting there playing with their phone, half asleep, ready, counting the minutes down until church gets out so they can go eat some chicken and get away from the church building. That's, that's a picture. It doesn't matter what church it is. That's a picture in every congregation. I heard uh, the great pastor Nathaniel Haney, Stockton, California, listen to a lesson earlier today. And he talked about in the city of Stockton, he, there's thousands and thousands of backsliders and people in his church that he's honored to pastor. That's one of the greatest churches in the world. And yea, that church even, of course it does. It has carnal people and so forth. So every church does. These are the two spirits. Philadelphia. Let's go there. Can we go now? Verse 7 of Revelation chapter 3. Verse 7, Revelation chapter 3, down to verse 13. And I'm going to just spend a little time working through this. This, this church in Philadelphia, it was in that city. Well, the city in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, is noted in America as a city of brotherly love, but it's actually not the root of where that name comes from. It comes from a man that founded, yea, built that city, that ancient city. 
and his last name was a derivative of Philadelphia, as we would say it. This was a Roman town until A.D. 1379 when it fell. And it tells us historically based upon New Unger's Bible's dictionary that Philadelphia had a population of somewhere between 10,000 to 20,000 at the time of the writing of Revelation 3. Considered even then a smaller city and certainly compared to Ephesus, Rome, and Jerusalem even, it was a smaller city. It says here in Revelation 3, 7, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So the holy God is speaking, yea, to a holy people that is still taking place today. A holy God is speaking unto holy people. Yes, he can speak to a sinner and call them to salvation. But the constant free-flowing dialogue relationship between God and his people that is there, that is strengthened, that is protected because the people of God are consecrating themselves. Because the people, the men and women of God are giving themselves to prayer. They are coming out of the world. They are separate. They have attuned their ear and their spirit to hear from God. So a holy God is speaking to a holy people. You go back and you study about the priesthood, even extending it into the Nazarites, and you read about the ministry of God in the pages of your Bible. They were set apart for the purpose of the master's use. They were consecrated. They were set aside for being holy so that they would not be defiled, so that they can hear from God. They can be a vessel that God can flow through. How many know we're all in this great church of God, this global church? We're all called to be witnesses, ambassadors of Christ, priests unto the Lord. We should accept the admonishment to be a part, to be set apart, to be a holy and peculiar people that our ear can hear from God. It's a problem you have to repent every time you come into the house of God to be able to get something out of the service. We should be instant in season and out of season, flowing in the spirit, ready to receive from God. But God has opened up a door, yea, that no man could shut, that no man could shut. He says in verse 8, and this is a common theme that he speaks throughout these passages to these seven churches. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man could shut it. Let me just speak a word to you right now. It stuck with me many years ago. First and foremost from the Bible, this truth I'm reading. Secondly, the great elder that's gone on to his eternal reward. Two of his sons are bishops of great churches in the state of Florida. The great elder, Jesse Williams, bishop pastor in North Carolina for many, many years. Two of his sons, both of them are my elders. I revere them. See, Pat Williams, one of his sons, was a longtime district superintendent in this Florida district. And then Mike Williams, another one of his sons, is a pastor, yea, bishop, great world wide traveling speaker, pastors a great church in the Orlando area in Apopka. Well, that man, Jesse Williams, many years ago, I heard him in a message share how God spoke to him when he went to North Carolina. He was an engineer, very gifted man, made well, uh, made a strong income, but God called him to go plant a church. And he went to go start a church with more questions and answers. But he said, God spoke to him this word. Revelations 3, 7, and 8. I have set before you an open door. And then it goes on. Paul speaks that there was many people in the city. That's the word that God spoke unto the elder Jesse Williams. And God gave him great revival. God has set before the church in this day and in this hour 
an open door, an open door. And we need to walk through those open doors for the church, for you as an individual. There was doors, and it was prophesied to our church a few weeks ago. There was doors that had been closed and fastened that we have approached before. And like the widow and the unjust judge, we have knocked upon them. Times past, they would not open. They would not open. And we have given up on that. And God spoke a word of prophecy to our church a few weeks ago. And the word was essentially that if you will go back to those doors, I have opened those doors up. I have unfastened them. I have removed the lock. And as you approach them, they may appear to be closed. But if you will do what Moses done, go as far as you can go, yea, to the brink of the Red Sea. When you get to where you can't go no farther, I will open the door. They are unlocked. They are ready for us to step through. I am telling you in this community, I am honored to pastor. I have been contacted within the last week by a sheriff. I have received correspondence from the mayor's office. These are people that I have not yet previously connected to. I am connected to the county sheriff and many other political government leaders, I say very humbly in this community. These are people I've never connected to. A neighboring city sheriff, a neighboring city mayor's office, and the director of Red Cross for Southwest Florida has all reached out to me. Want to know how we can get involved with their programs and what they're doing, inviting us to be part of it. I'm telling you that God in this late hour has opened up a door. He's waiting for men and women to say, I'm willing. Who will go? Will you go? Who will answer the call to pray? Who will answer the call to send a text, to do an online Bible study, to call somebody, to go work in a homeless shelter, to go give out some food, to go aid the widows and the shut-ins? Who will go? Who will go teach that Bible study? So there was an open door. Continue on, verse 8. And the Lord of heaven says, I, I see that thou hast but a little strength. So the good saints in Philadelphia, the, the strength was fading. It was, they were getting weary. They was getting weakened in the spirit, I guess, and maybe in the mind or in the emotion, they had but a little strength. But it says, what a great testimony, and has kept my word, has kept my word. And has not denied my name. Very, very significant. So they have held to the word of God and the name of God. Not denying his name. It's no mistake, friend of mine, that that is in the opening words of the positive description given of the church of Philadelphia. The church that receives admonishments and accolades but no word of correction. It's no mistake that in the opening words to that church, Jesus, the Lord of heaven, affirms to them that they have held to the word and held to the name. We want to hear the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We want to hear the words, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Take thy rest. Come on into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come up hither for the rapture. We want to hear those words from Jesus. We need to. Though we have but a little strength, can I have an amen? Though we have but a little strength, though it seems like at times we have little resources, though at times we have little support, though at times we don't really hear the great number of witnesses standing with us, we have just a few. We need to stand in faith, though we have little strength, and hold to the word of God, and hold to the name of Jesus. The Lord of heaven, Jesus Christ, wanted it on the record that this church was still standing, though they have little strength, because I believe they held to the word and held to the name. Can I have an amen? Verse 9, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but they do lie. It's interesting to me how Jesus takes a position even here against people that say they're one thing and they're not. 
Sounds very much like what Jesus says as a group of people in the last days that honored me with their lips, but their hearts are far removed from me. They honored me with their lips, but their hearts are far removed. In Christianity, it's really not what you say, it's what you do. It's not so much the things that you declare, the bumper sticker, the fish symbol, or what you even say with your mouth. There does come a time and a place that you need to speak what you believe and declare it. But more than any of that, it's what we live. People, everybody right now are so quick to just post an opinion about anything. More than an opinion change in the world, our actions, our example, our lifestyle, our witness, the fruits that we bear, that's what's going to change the world. Christ working through us for his glory. So uh, Jesus here is taking a position against some people. Notice that said they were Jews and they were not. They were lying. Well, that's interesting. That's exactly the same thing he said in Revelations 2, Revelations 2, verse 9. The other church that receives a very positive, positive report in Smyrna, in Smyrna, another church that receives a very positive report. He also takes issue with there in Revelations 2.9 that there were some Jews that said they were, but they really were not. They were of the synagogue of Satan. This, this statement here, Jew, in Revelations 2.9, more specifically to today's lesson, Revelations 3.9 to the church of Philadelphia, that, that's just a point of identity, identifying them as yea, being natural born citizens, being Jews, but they have not yet embraced the one true God of the Jews, that one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they had not done as Paul, a Jew of the Jews, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, had embraced the full revelation of that one God in Jesus Christ. And we know the fullness of the Godhead was bodily in him. So that's the purpose of him singling them out as Jews. They they say they are, it appears for benefit, maybe personal gain, but they're really not. They're really not. I mean, no, they even had to deal with hypocrites in biblical days, in biblical days. But then it goes on, the end of verse 9, and it says, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Verse 10, this begins to get into the meat or the crust of what uh, the Lord is dealing with here in Revelations 3 to John's recording on the Isle of Pappas. It says in Revelations 3 verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Now I want you to see this, okay? Out of the mouths of two or three, let every word be established. Pay close attention in scripture, any scripture, Anywhere in your Bible, the 66 books, especially when you see this in the same passage, in the same verse, in a short number of verses. Pay close attention to repetition. When you see repetition in the Bible, pay close attention to that. Give note to where it shows up at. What covenant? Is it Old Testament? Is it New Testament? <clears throat> Is it New Testament Gospels? Is it the church age? Acts 2 forward. Pay close attention to repetition. One scholar said it this way, that repetition is God's way of italicizing the words. Highlighting it, you know, when you read through and something significant, maybe in a, a research book or scholarly book that you're reading, many times they will italicize it or bold it or underline it or something of that nature. Well, one scholar said, God's repetition is his way of italicizing or highlighting the significance of something. Jews believe it this way. Out of the mouths of two or three, let every word be established. It's a biblical truth. But Jews believe that when something is said three times in the same sequence or in the same portion of time, that that means literally to infinity and beyond. That establishes that truth. Holy, holy, holy. That establishes that truth to infinity and beyond. It goes beyond time. It goes into eternity. It establishes that truth to infinity and beyond. That's how the Jews view that. 
when something said three times in scripture. That's where we get the New Testament teaching by Paul out of the mouth of two or three, let every word be established. Well, with that being said, here in this passage, to the truth of them, the saints of Philadelphia, holding to the word and holding to the name, you see that illustrated. A couple different times, he says in verse 8 that they've kept my word, emphasis word. In verse 10, in the opening words, Jesus says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. So you see emphasis in Revelations 3, verse 8 and verse 10, upon what? Upon the word. You can't just skim over that. That should jump out at us. When we see things repeated, it should jump out at us. So he sees emphasis here. We see emphasis upon the word. So again, the Lord is making an extra note to celebrate these saints of Philadelphia keeping, holding to, keeping the word. He goes on in verse 10. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Can you type in temptation? From the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This is very significant to me, okay? If you've listened to me, me, if you've listened to me teach any, you understand that I believe very clearly that the Bible presents a pre-tribulation rapture for the bride of Christ for the church. I believe that very strongly. And I have about a 70-page lesson in my book on the unveiling. And you can get that through our website, hopeapostolicqpc.org, in the store. But I believe it very strongly. To me, it's absolutely no question. Now, I don't go as far as saying people that believe different are false prophets. Some people do say that. I don't. But I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture very strongly. But as you've heard me even teach last week, in this verse, Revelations 3.10, Jesus is speaking. Now, you have to remember something here. When you study the book of Revelation. A couple things to keep in mind in terms of the layout, in terms of the layout. Just like the Gospels, you need to approach that with a particular mindset in terms of the layout. And then when you study Revelation, you have to approach it with a particular mindset in terms of the layout. What does that mean? Well, Revelation chapter 1, the initial 15 verses or so, is an introduction. Okay? But then the latter part of Revelation 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 deals very specifically with the seven churches of Asia Minor in a broad view at the church age, at the church age. Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is a glimpse of what John, one that is taken up into heaven, it's a type of the rapture, Revelation 4, 1, it's a type of, it's a glimpse of what John, one that was taken up in the rapture, sees in heaven. He sees a lamb in Revelation 5, a glorious picture of Revelations 4 and 5. But then we get to Revelation chapter 6 to 18. And it's very clear that is a picture of the seven years of tribulation. I don't know that I've seen anybody refute, <clears throat> ref <clears throat> excuse me, refute that point. Even people that believe in a post-tribulation rapture agree that Revelation chapter 6 to 18 largely focuses upon the events of the tribulation. And then Revelations 19 is a discussion of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 20 goes over the thousand-year millennial reign or kingdom, some of it. And then the great white throne judgment. Revelations 22 and 21 goes through what heaven's going to be like. Why did I say all that? I said all that to say this. <clears throat> that Revelations, the end of chapter 1 and chapter 2 and 3 is written to us, the church. Seven unique churches, unique congregations in Asia Minor at the latter part of the first century, but then to the broader church, that's us. Just like we would take the writings of Ephesus, of Philippi, of Colossia, of Corinth, and so forth, we take these writings as well as being directly applicable to us, circular writings as they're called. So with that in mind, go back to 
Revelation 3.10. Can I have an amen if you're with me here? Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And the Lord of heaven says to this faithful church of Philadelphia, he says, I'm going to keep you because you've held to my word and you have held to my name. I'm going to keep you, verse 10, Revelation 3, from the hour of temptation. Well, go back with me and notice what he says in Revelation 2, 22, to the church of Thyatira, to those that do not hold to the doctrine or the sins of this false prophetess Jezebel. He says to those good saints in Thyatira, Behold, I will cast her, Jezebel, verse 22, Revelations 2, into a bed, a place of judgment, and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Verse 24, Revelations 2. He's continuing to talk to the saints of the church of Thyatira. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not, this doctrine of Jezebel, fornication, idolatry, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So do you see that? The people in Thyatira that embrace, I said this last week, let me just touch it again. The people of Thyatira, the saints, quote unquote, that embraced the wicked woman that came in the spirit of Jezebel that was uh, causing people to commit idolatry and fornication that was causing people to embrace errant doctrines. The Lord says, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to cast them into a place of judgment, the bed of Jezebel. And with her, they will suffer great tribulation, great tribulation. Okay, except they repent of their deeds. Now, this is literally going into the tribulation passages of Revelation 6 forward. So it's no question the context here. And, and he even points out to the saints at Thyatira that have done wrong, that if they repent of their deeds, they still have a chance. But if they don't, they will go into this great tribulation. But then he says in verse 24, Revelations 2, are you with me now? He says in verse 24, but the rest of you in Thyatira that have not accepted the doctrine of the witch Jezebel, her fornication, her idolatry. You have not accepted those things. He says in verse 24, Revelations 2, you have not known the depths of Satan. I will not, Jesus says, put this burden upon you, the burden of the great tribulation, the burden of the wrath. Well, those terms, burden, great tribulation from those verses, Revelations 2, 22, 24, is the same verbiage speaking of the same thing that uh, Revelation 3.10 is speaking of when it says the hour of temptation. All of that burden, great tribulation, hour of temptation, it, it's all seen as Jeremiah would write about in Jeremiah 34-7, Jacob's trouble. It's all seen as Daniel wrote about it in Daniel 9.24-27, Daniel's 70th week. It's all seen as that time of great tribulation, the seven years it's seen in Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 18. But as he said to the church previously, many times in Paul's writings, about five, that you will be kept from the wrath. He says again to the church of Thyatira that because you refuse the doctrine of the prophetess, the wicked false prophetess Jezebel, you will not go through the great tribulation. And you will not have to deal with this burden. Likewise, he says to this great church in Philadelphia that, that I will not try you. I will not make you go through the hour of temptation. Can we go back to Revelations 3 and 10? As Jesus, it's red letter edition, as they say, it's all red letter edition. It's all Jesus. But as they say in red, Jesus speaking to the church of Philadelphia. Revelations 3.10, how many know all the scriptures inspired by God, given by God? If you take any of it, you got to take all of it. Can't pick and choose. Line upon line, precept upon precept is what it says. So it goes on, uh, Revelations 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. 
to try them that dwell upon the earth. So this this, this is very significant to me. Say, so this hour of temptation, I've had people say, well, uh, that's not speaking of the seven years of tribulation. It's clearly speaking of the seven years of tribulation. And he says to the saints of Philadelphia, I'm going to keep you from that. Why can I say so strongly that statement out of temptation is speaking specifically to the seven years of tribulation? The entire world will feel the seven years of tribulation. There's 21 judgments that the, comes down from heaven, seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and seven bowl of vile judgments. The entire world feels that. When you get into the trumpet judgments, it says over and over, a third of the grass is burned up. A third of the trees are gone. A third of the fresh water is gone. A third of the oceans and salty water is gone. You think about that, that's going to affect the entire world. A third of the sun is gone. A third of the earth is going to have uh, literally an ice age. That's going to affect all the world, just like it says in verse in verse 10. So that statement, our temptation, is speaking very specifically towards what would be come the seven years of tribulation. It's going to affect all them that dwell upon the entirety of the earth. There's nothing else that's affected the earth over a long period like that. Even Noah's flood, of course, Revelation 3 is written well after Noah's flood. But even Noah's flood, it rained 40 days and 40 nights, right? There was upon the boat, Noah, Ham, Shem, Jephthah, the wives, eight of them, was upon the boat, best we could tell, about 380 days before it comes to rest on Mount Ararat. But you know the thing about Noah's flood, though, it was devastating upon the whole surface of the earth. The rain, the judgment of it, only lasted 40 days and 40 nights. And then it began to dry up. Well, likewise, this judgment, it won't just last for 40 days and 40 nights. It lasts for seven years. And it perpetually gets worse and worse as you move through it, from the seals to the trumpets to the bio judgments. Continue on with me. I hope you're with me here. I'm getting into some deep water now, but I hope you're with me. It says in Revelations 3 and 11, as we continue to study about the Church of Philadelphia, continuing in the broadest series over the last five weeks or so of the seven churches of Revelations 2 and 3, the seven churches of Asia Minor. It says in Revelations 3, 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So we need to hold on to it. We need to hold on to what God has given us. Verse 12. Him that overcometh, that's another one of those themes that you see is redundant. It's, it's declared unto all seven churches. All seven churches, here's the same statement. Overcome, 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 overcome. Seven times over. To him that overcometh will I make. Promises are different. Admonishments are different. Words of correction to some are different. But, but the statement overcome is given to all seven churches. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem. And which cometh down out of heaven from my God will I write upon him my New. Somebody say new. Can you type in new? New name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So this statement, new name, that's interesting. But again, you see, as you've seen the emphasis here with the word, the saints in the church of Philadelphia held to the word. That's emphasized twice in a short little passage. It's emphasized in verse 8, verse 10. They also held to what? The name. The name. That's a key focal point of this admonishment from the Lord to them. You see the emphasis upon the name in verse 8 and twice again in verse 12. In verse 12. Let me just touch for a moment this statement, this this new, this new name, this new name. Well, I just I want to highlight a couple of things here. It's interesting when you talk about that. He says at the end of the admonishment to the church at Ephesus, a new name. I will write upon him a new name. In this day, 
in this age up until time no more. The name of Jesus is a name that's highly exalted above every name. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. In Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of the Godhead was in him. When you say Jesus, you cover the full totality, encompassing complete revelation of all that God is. Okay? That's very clear in Scripture. you have any questions about that, go back and study the videos I taught in April of 2020, four Tuesday nights, same Facebook page. I taught about five hours, four Tuesday nights in a row on understanding who Jesus is. But it's interesting, the statement, new name. Now, this is speaking of eternity, time no more, heaven, New Jerusalem. Well, when you go forward, I won't get into it deeply, but when you go forward in the Revelation chapter 19, verse 12 to 13, this is when Jesus comes on the white horse, and it says in verse 12 of Revelation 19, when he comes on the white horse to Armageddon to throw the Antichrist and the false prophet, the closing verses of Revelation 19, into Guiana, the lake of fire. This is a picture of what John seen when he seen Jesus coming on the white horse with the armies of heaven, the church, the angels, and some of many of the Old Testament saints. He says in Revelation 19, 12, and Jesus, he had a name that no man knew. So new name, Revelation 3, 12, Revelation 19, 12, a name that no man knew. So this is preparing the releasing of that name, literally as a, on the brink of eternity, a, a new, a name that no man knew, but he himself, he himself. Verse 13, it says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. It's a lot of teaching here, but it says he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood of all the enemies he's defeated in battle. And his name is called the Word of God. That's very fascinating to me. His name is called the Word of God. Hold to that. That's very key. Then you continue. When you get to Revelation 22, this is literally a picture of time no more, heaven New Jerusalem, eternity, streets of gold, okay? That's what Revelation 22 is. Everything's over. Everything on the prophetic timeline scripturally has been done by the time you get to Revelation 22. The great white throne judgment is the last thing that takes place. And then after that, New Jerusalem comes down, new heaven, new earth. Okay, notice what it says in Revelation 22. All of this is tied to the thought in eternity, in heaven, New Jerusalem, when there's time no more, there's going to be a releasing of a greater acknowledgement, understanding, understanding of the completeness of all that God is. Yea, this name, new name, as scripture calls it, new name, as the scripture calls it. And it says in Revelation 22, verse 2 and 3, and there should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, catch it, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. The Bible says in 1 John 3 and 2 that when Jesus comes, we don't know altogether what he's going to be, but we know this, that when he comes, we are going to be as he is. We look through a glass darkly now. Paul writes that in the closing verses of 1 Corinthians 13, I believe. In terms of prophecy, we, we know in part now. Paul writes that to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians 14. Prophecy we know in part now. Any Bible teacher, myself, your good pastor, anyone else, we do our very best job to thoroughly expound the scriptures. I do. I can speak for myself. To try to expound the scriptures and line them up and present as much of a revelation and clear picture of the Bible and eternity as we can. But with all that being said, we look to a glass darkly now. We know We'll know him as he is. Yea, this is my thought and conclusion on the statement new name seen in Revelation 3, 12. Father talked about in Revelation 19, 13 and verse 12 before that. And then ultimately Revelation 22, verse 2 and 3. This is my concluding thought on that. Again, I say. Please don't put words in my mouth or misquote me. The name of Jesus in this earth, 
yea, from now until the end of time, is a name that's highly exalted above every name. It is the name that is above every name. When you say the name of Jesus, if you realize it or not, if I realize it or not, it includes, it's a full encompassing of the totality of the Godhead, of all that God is. But in this life, we're limited by memory, by mental capacity, me and you, all of us, <clears throat> even people with the highest IQ with the greatest memory, we're limited, we're limited. And then we have to deal with the flesh and distractions and jobs and hindrances and carnality and Satan and demons and weariness and all of this. So we can understand who God is. We can, we can to a great, great revelation. But you know what happens, I think, in eternity? I think God opens up our mind even the more. I believe God opens up our mind even the more. Notice what he says in Revelations 19, 12, and 13. Yea, Jesus coming on the white horse. He had a name written that no man knew. His name is called the Word of God. So it was written on this vesture. He had a name written that no man knew. But it was called the Word of God. You know what that is? That's saying to me this, that every revelation, some of those verses we can't remember, some of those verses we just scratch the surface on, some of the components that we've not been able to tie together, even the most brilliant teachers among us. When we get to eternity, because we're not going to have a, a carnal natural mind, we're not going to be limited by flesh and frailty, we're not going to be limited or distracted by the things of this life. I believe in eternity. God is going to give us a complete and absolute eternal revelation of him like we have never received before. Like we have never received before. Can I have a good, strong amen? A good, strong amen. Let me just finish up with a couple of closing comments here. And I'll open up with this next week. The Church of Laodicea. I'll teach this lesson next Friday, 1 o'clock. It covers Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 22. As I've already said, Philadelphia is this great remnant that represents God's great church, apostolic Christian church in the world from the day of Pentecost up until the rapture. I'm part of one of those types of churches. I say very humbly. There's many of those congregations or churches throughout the world. And, and I celebrate that. That is seen as the spirit, yea, as a type of Philadelphia. But then you come to Laodicea. Laodicea is the other side of it. It's the apostate. It's the worldly. It's the lukewarm group of people. And it's written about captured scene in many places. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 5. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4. James 5, 1 to 8. 2 Peter 2, almost the whole chapter, 1 to 22. 2 Peter 3, verse 3 to 6, the book of Jude, all of it. And Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 30. It's seen that type of spirit that the church would deal with, that Laodicea, worldly type of spirit. It's, it's like the tares. The wheat represents Philadelphia. The tares represents Laodicea. Let them grow together together. And in judgment, Jesus said, the Lord of the harvest, I'll come and separate them. And the wheat goes yonder up into a safe place, the barn uh, up yonder in heaven. And, and then the tares are cast and burnt in the fire. So we'll pick it up right there next week with Laodicea. If you have any comments or questions with your pastor's blessing, feel free to reach out to us, pastordagan at gmail.com. And uh, let me just pray over us right now. God bless you, friend. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. Stand with all of us that we can see greater revival in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, friend. Hope to see you next Friday at 1 o'clock. Have a great day.